Hey, <clears throat> everybody here? Everybody here sometime. Everybody here sometime. <laughs> What's up? Come on now. <clears throat> Brian, thank you for encouraging me. Thank you for the, the, the uplifting words the viewers have gone on. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Brian. <clears throat> May the Lord Jesus... <clears throat> Fill my throat, my chest, my lungs with the breath of life and cleanse and clear my throat by the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and give me the health I need to glorify him and the holiness to delight his heart in Jesus' name. <clears throat> I got a couple of links for you guys and a couple of surprises. We're going to wait a few more minutes. But I appreciate that, Brian. <clears throat> what up, Muhammad Sheikh? Is first and the last here or is he last? We were saying in a Long. Better question, Luke Hills, is what is my view of you? Yeah, I know, Louisa, that's that's how they are. <clears throat> Andrew Martin said that they're probably hiding my channel, that YouTube is doing it deliberately. We were sailing oh, long. The moonlight may just keep praying that the last thing that I lose is my sight and my voice so I can use my eyes to read scripture and my voice to glorify Christ. What's up, Jeremy? What it is? You were not here for the first session, you're here for the second session. You kind of hurt me, bro. You hurt my heart. All right. Okay, I'm just waiting for first and last. Is he not here again? <coughs> <coughs> Okay. Oh, you got a notification? I'm shocked. You better quit. What's up, yo? What's up? You can't play with my... Yo, yo. They're trying to play me out. They're trying... Are you ready, guys? We're ready? Let's, let's ask the Lord to bless. Father, bless this session as you did the first session. <clears throat> for the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus. And I ask, Father, for this grace. By the power of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> speak life to my throat my chest, my lungs, fill my throat, my chest, and lungs with the breath of life, and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to you, to the ears of your servants, Father. Bless this session to speak truth without error for your glory, Father. The glory of your beloved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Anoint me to recall these passages and interpret them perfectly, Father. Destroy distractions of Satan. Crucify my flesh to overcome my flesh and not be a stumbling block, Father unnecessarily but to be constrained by your spirit to conform to the image of christ and i pray that for everyone that we all conform to the image of jesus and help me not to repay evil with evil and destroy my unrighteous anger father so that i will shine with the beauty of christ and i pray that for everyone <clears throat> that we learn the faith and live the faith for the glory of jesus christ lord leave no man an excuse to slander our testimony father and, Father, have your way. Bless this session. Save us from Satan and his children and the distractions of Satan, Father. And, Lord, be with our loved ones who can't be with us. Those who are not saved, grant them salvation. Those who are saved, keep them in love with Jesus. And in my case, my daughters, my angels, my heart from Jesus. Bless them and love them and seal them by your spirit and wash them in the blood of Jesus and bring them sooner than later, Abba, please, so I can be in their life and be Jesus to them. Use this session, Father, please, and bring them, Lord, by your spirit, draw them, Lord, so that Jesus will increase in us. We will decrease and sit enthroned upon our hearts. Our hearts are the throne of Jesus. Have your way. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name, Yahweh, the Father, that's good. <clears throat> Guys, help me to help you. Try not to allow people to distract you and engage you in side discussions because that's a trick of the devil. Satan will use even innocent, gullible Christians, right, who don't mean to be used of the devil. None of us want to be used of the devil. Thank you guys for the super chat. God bless you and watch over you. And may the Lord Jesus use this super chat to provide for my needs and my daughter's needs in Jesus' name. Please, Lord, preserve this. Preserve this, Lord, from evil doers who would seek to try to rob me and my children. Please, Father. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Yeah, um, 
None of us want abuse of the devil, but sometimes innocently Satan uses us to distract one another. Ask the Lord Jesus to protect you. I have no idea what you're talking about, Chiara Tiara. And Chiara Tiara, can I ask you, what's the point of mentioning David Wood and his new channel? Why are you bringing it up? What do you accomplish? See, I just said Christians will be used of the devil to be distractions. If he gets 50 million, what's it to you? Who cares? And why are you trying to make me compete with this brother? I don't get it. What's your problem, Chair? Can you help me understand your logic? Thank you, Alex. I just got done, guys, isn't it? Isn't it weird? I just got done saying Christians will be used of the devil, not trying to be used of the devil. Now, guys, I'm like, and I'm not a sharp guy. Can you explain to me what was the point of Chara telling me David Wood started a new YouTube channel? He's already got 2,600 2, people. What is the purpose of telling me that? <clears throat> I just, can someone help me understand her logic? Or his logic? I'm assuming it's a her, but maybe it's not. It's a him. Okay, why would Ahmad be able to answer you? How would Ahmad know what's going on in David Wood's channel? And why do you think Ahmad here would have the answer? I'm trying to see your justification because I think you are being used as the devil to distract. And I think it's deliberate. Mods, can I ask you a question, guys? Forgive me. Let me just because I want to teach people. Teach people not to be stupid and use of the devil, but to be alert for the glory of Christ. Would you mods know why David Wood's new channel got already 2,600 subscribers? Are you privy to that information? Do you also have David Wood's bank account information and social security? Do you know how much he makes every year? And does he pay his taxes and so on and so forth? Cherry. I love you, sister. Don't be her attorney or his attorney. Don't be her or his attorney. If she needs legal representation, she can get a public defender or he can get a public defender or hire. Okay. Bye-bye, Shara. Yes, go. Don't come back. Okay, guys, thank you. Guys, don't be public defenders or attorneys for anyone. Okay? Okay, yes. So focus with me. Let me repeat again for the glory of Jesus and may the Lord constrain us and crucify our flesh. Let's not cause each other to stumble. Don't let Satan use you because in your naivete and innocence, you can be used of the devil to distract. May God prosper David Wood. He's my brother in Christ. We're all in it together. We're on the same team. We banter back and forth, but that's out of jest. And if you guys think that's serious, then you really, something wrong with you. Right, I know God will use David mightily for the glory of Christ, and I pray he uses me, and we're in a team, and we're inseparable by the power of the Holy Spirit. So why tell me, ah, oh, David Wood's channel, new channel, he's got 2,600, what gives? What? And? That's okay, Farida can try to debate us. And Muhammad Sheikh, don't bring in irrelevant topics, irrelevant issues, the focus here, the focus here is Jesus. The focus here is the Bible. The focus is learning core doctrines of the Christian faith. Don't talk about things that are not part of the focus. Hing your previous Sam. I don't know what hing your previous Sam means. What's hing? Panos Filippo. Are you speaking Greek and English? Right? Now, it's okay. Just want to let you guys know. Now, before I do that, I want to give you some articles. Are you ready? I gave you a link to one article in the previous session. I'm going to give you a link to that article again and another article. You need to study these articles. Again, you don't need to do anything. I'm saying if you want to learn your faith, if you want to learn your faith, then do study these materials. I'm using the Joe Witness Bible to prove that Joe's witnesses are wrong and that Jesus is Jehovah and not the creature, Michael, from their own Bible. Okay? So here's the link. You have my permission to print them or upload them to your website as long as you don't charge people. Freely receive, freely you shall give. Okay? So that's that's one article. Let me post it again. Okay? Now let me give you the other article. 
Here's the other article. I didn't give this in the previous session, but I'm going to give it now. And I'm going to briefly address the seven spirits because that came up as an objection. Here's a second article, folks. Please. I'm showing you how to use even the Joe Witness Bible to prove the Trinity and that Joe's witnesses are wrong. Okay? Everyone clear? Everyone with me? Everyone focus? Everyone in the saddle? So we can begin. If it's less than before, God's will be done. Even though I want more people, but it's not about numbers. It's about quality of the numbers for the glory of Christ. Okay, now, let's again break down because some people may not understand why Revelation depicts the Holy Spirit as seven spirits. And that came up as an objection by some coward who wanted to debate me in the previous session. Came under another nick in the comments section, but wouldn't tell me his religion. So he doesn't have to defend his falsehood, his satanic doctrine. Right? That's how these cowards are. They hide under mm, pseudonyms. And won't tell you what they believe because they know that you'll decimate what they believe if it contradicts the core doctrines of the Bible, like the Trinity. So they want to just come under a pseudonym, attack, and run. Right? But anyway, with that said, let's go to Revelation 4, verse 5, and Revelation 5, verse 6. I hope Anna's here, Louisa's here, everyone else is here. I don't know, Magdalene, she's here. She's probably tired, sleeping, but all the regulars that were there, I hope they show up again. If not, it's archived. Revelation 4, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. So John saw what looked like seven lamps. And he tells you that the seven lamps are the seven spirits of God. Yes, do hit the like button. Seven spirits of God. So notice in Revelation 4 where John is caught in the spirit to be transported to heaven. To see heaven, right? Now, by the way, although he's in heaven, things in heaven don't appear as they are. They appear oftentimes <clears throat> in images that are meant to bring out a spiritual significance, a spiritual truth for us to Learn. In other words, when he sees seven lamps, and he says those seven lamps are the spirits, the seven spirits of God, don't assume that if we do go to heaven, we'll see seven actual lamps. We may, we may not. Let me explain how revelation functions. The reason why he sees seven lamps is that because that image is conveying a deeper spiritual meaning for John and his readers. So not everything in heaven that John beholds is as it appears in heaven. In other words, if I'm in heaven, I may not see seven lamps. So he is in heaven by the Holy Spirit, but God is showing things to John that may not be the way heaven actually appears. So why would God then show John these images that may not necessarily convey the reality of heaven, because those images are shown to John to bring out a more deeper spiritual truth and significance. Are you with me there? You understand what's going on here? So though he's in heaven, God is showing heaven in such a way that at times he may be seeing what heaven actually looks like. But at times he's seeing symbols in heaven. That not, may not really be re a reflection of what heaven is like, but those symbols appear in heaven in order to can convey a deeper spiritual significance. Is that clear or am I confusing it? I'm praying by God's grace. I'm clear and articulate, and he makes the sound of my voice pleasing to your ears for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Is that clear before I move on? In other words, if you go to heaven... Don't be shocked and disappointed you don't see seven lamps. It doesn't mean he's not in heaven. He is. The Holy Spirit has taken him to heaven. But it means that God is showing heaven in such a way where there will be things that he sees as they are, but then he sees symbols that don't necessarily reflect the reality of heaven, but those symbols are there to tell us something about heaven on a deeper spiritual level. Amen. The glory to the Trinity this Wednesday and every day for all eternity. Is that clear? Do you want to make sure I'm not confusing you? So let's go to Revelation 4, 5 again and 5, 6 to show you 
Okay. That here the seven spirits appear in two different forms, in two different ways. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So notice the seven spirits of God appear visibly as seven lamps of fire. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Now notice again, same heaven, same dimension. Notice how the seven spirits appear later on. Same heaven, same dimension. Seven spirits appear as seven lamps of fire before the throne, but then they also appear differently at the same time. Guys, pay attention because you're going to learn meat. Revelation 5 or 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now notice, in the same dimension, same heaven, John sees the seven spirits of seven lamps, but then he sees them as seven eyes on the face of the lamb. So the seven spirits appear in two different visible shapes and forms at the same time. Okay. So now the question is, who or what are the seven spirits? By seven spirits, John doesn't mean seven literal spirits, and they're not seven angels. Now, guys, I need you to listen here. If you don't listen, you're not going to get the point. Okay. You're not going to get the point. By seven spirits, he doesn't mean seven angels. And not every reference to seven is symbolic. You will see in John where the number seven actually refers to actual seven things, whether seven actual angels or seven hills, right, that <clears throat> represents the beast or, you know, the whore, the city of the beast, and so on and so forth. Here, the seven spirits refer to the Holy Spirit. Why is the Holy Spirit depicted as seven spirits? Let me break that down real quickly. I've broken this down in previous sessions. I need to break it down in this session. First, I want you to know, good, Louisa. I've already broken this down, but I'm going to break it down again. And Louisa, please make sure that I help you understand. And don't let me go into another topic until you get this point, because I want you to get it. First of all, let me explain why Jesus appears as a lamb. If you go and look at the Greek lexicon, let me get it to you. Greek lexicon. Yeah, i got to break this down too. Woo. <laughs> Let's do this. A lot of work. Okay, but here. Let's go here. Let me get you the Greek interlinear. Interlinear. Click here. You'll see that the word for lamb is arnion. Arnion. Where does it come from? Okay. Here's the link. I just gave you it. Arnion means a small lamb. Now, there's another word for lamb. It's amnos. Amnos. Right? That's used in John 129. Here it's arnion. Why did John use this word arnion? Arnion, Arnion. Okay. Because this refers to a small lamb. Okay. Now, guys, please, if you want me, help me to help you and listen. I know I'm not wrong in Revelation 4 5. Just be patient. Okay. Little lamb. Jesus appears as a young male lamb. Young male lamb. And it says, as though it was slain. The way they used to. Kill lambs, the way they slew lambs is they slit the throat. So J Jesus is appearing to John as a young male lamb, the throat slit and bloody, but he's alive, not dead. Why as a young male lamb? Because if you go to Exodus chapter 12, when God ordered the slaughter of the Passover lambs, God said each household must take one male lamb a year old. A one-year-old male lamb and kill it, eat the flesh, don't break the bones, take the blood, mix it up with hyssop, right? Bitter herbs, put the blood on the top and the sides of the door, and then death will pass over them. 
Jesus is appearing as our Passover lamb. That's why he's appearing as a young male lamb. In other words, this signifies that there's a new exodus of a new community of God where you have a new lawgiver and a new Joshua and a new Passover coming out of a new Egypt. That's why in Revelation, if you pay attention to the plagues that come upon the earth, the same plagues that came upon Egypt. So the story of the New Testament is a new exodus where Egypt is the world and the Pharaoh is Satan. And God is setting us free from this ruler, this Pharaoh, Satan, and the world is Egypt. And Moses has come, a new Moses, Jesus, to give us a new law, a new covenant, who's also our Joshua, who brings us into the promised land. And this is now our desert, desert sojourning. You with me there? So why is Jesus appearing as a young male lamb? He is the Passover that has been slain. Well, if he's been slain, that means you've been redeemed. Because it was the Passover lamb that set Israel free from their bondage to slavery in Egypt. Jesus' death is what ransoms you from your bondage to Satan and this fallen world and to sin. And that's what it goes on to say in Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. You were slain, and by your blood, you ransomed, redeemed. You with me there? So why does he appear as a young male lamb? Because he's our Passover. Why seven horns? Okay, let's see what horn means in Revelation. Revelation 17, verse 12. What does seven horns mean? Revelation 17, verse 12. And the ten horns, notice, horns, which thou sawest, are ten kings. So notice horn means king. Ten horns, ten kings. And if you're a king, what do you have? A kingdom. So these ten kings did not have a kingdom yet, as yet, but received power as king one hour with the beast. So notice horn represents a king that has power and a kingdom that he rules. So now why seven horns? Why the number seven? Let's see what seven represents. Revelation 15, verse 1. Why seven horns? Revelation 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels. Now, these are literally seven angels. We know because elsewhere they're mentioned as seven that stand in the presence of God. Having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. So notice why seven plagues? Because all it takes is seven plagues to make God's wrath complete. So notice seven means complete. Done. Finished. Because it's complete. If it's complete, there's nothing else to add. So seven becomes a symbolic number for perfection. Something that's been completed. If it's completed, it's finished. If it's finished... It lacks nothing. It's perfect. That's why, first last, if you can, put Revelation 15, verse 1 in the NIV. Just to show you. Luis, are you with me so far? I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. Seven angels. In the Bible, often represents completion. Why? Because how many days did it take God to create the heavens and the earth and complete them? How many days did it take God to create and complete the heavens and the earth? Six days. And so he rested on the seventh. The reason why he rested on the seventh, because the seventh day represent the work of creation's complete. It's finished, lacks nothing, I can stop. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. See, they were finished after six days. And all the hosts of them, complete. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. Finished, complete. 
which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So did you catch it? The heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them. His work came to them, it was complete. And James 1, 4 says, when something is complete, it's perfect, lacks nothing. James 1, 4. If you are complete, then you are perfect, you lack nothing. James 1, verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Do you catch it? When you're complete and perfect, you lack nothing. Creation was complete, finished, lacking nothing. So seven becomes a number of completion, perfection. So now let's do the math. Horn means power, means a king who has power to rule and subjugate and rules over a kingdom. So why does the lamb have seven horns? Because that's symbolic that he's the almighty king. His kingdom is indestructible. He's almighty. And because he's almighty, he's able to subjugate and thwart everyone and bring everyone under his control and subjugate everyone under his feet because there's no power equal to him, let alone greater than his power. In other words, seven horns means Jesus is the almighty king, the all-powerful king, the all-sovereign king. Clear? So then why seven eyes? Let's go to Revelation 5 or 6. Why seven eyes? You got it, Mike. All-knowing. What do you do with your eyes? You see. Why seven? No, you got it, Mike. You're, that's right. You're 100% right. Why seven? What do you do with your eyes? You see. Why seven? Meaning Jesus perfectly sees all things. Nothing escapes his knowledge, his sight. He sees everything perfectly. But notice it says the seven eyes are the seven spirits. Now, why is the spirit said to be seven spirits? Because that denotes the Holy Spirit is perfect, the all-perfect Spirit, the Spirit whose works are perfect, complete, lack nothing. So what this is telling you is Jesus is the Almighty King who is in union with the Spirit, who works with the Spirit, who in union with the Spirit sees everything and knows everything. Notice again the inseparable union between Christ and the Spirit. Jesus, the eternal companion of the Spirit, in union with the Spirit, sees all things and works with the Spirit, in union with the Spirit, and he knows everything. Now we have another dog here that barks like a satanic dog because Satan, who possesses him, is pricking his flesh. Uh, stupid. Let, let me explain to you why you're stupid. What does the seven eyes represent? Stupid. I don't want to insult stupid people because you are a dog of the devil. Sorry, guys. I'm not going to be kind. So then if that represents the Nomura, you moron. What does the seven eyes represent and the seven spirits, you moron? What does it represent? Because the same seven spirits are the seven eyes of Christ. So you're saying Jesus has a menorah attached to his face? Tell me this guy is not stupider than Muhammad. And what does the menorah represent in the tabernacle? Let me deal with you and muzzle you and your master by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. What does the menorah represent in the tabernacle? Because you're an idiot, you think you know scripture. And I have no mercy and compassion for dogs of the devil. Okay. You see why? Yeah. Answer the question so that you can prove that you can refute me. What does the menorah represent in the tabernacle? You said born again? Quote the verse to prove your point. Chapter and verse. You see a guy, like I said, an idiot. He makes Muhammad look intelligent. Quote the verse that says the seven 
lamps, menorah represents being born again. Quote the verse that says, the seven lamps are Yeshua. You see, you keep barking like a rabby dog, and I'm muzzling you for the glory of Jesus. Sorry, guys. We got to deal with dogs. Guys, don't hate me. This is how it works. When you got blasphemous dogs like this, you got to muzzle them. Show me where it says Yeshua is the menorah. Show it to me before you get sent back to the pit of hell that you came from. Show me where it says Yeshua is the menorah. And where it says menorah means born again. I don't mean insult dogs. Dogs are cleaner than this pig. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't mean insult pigs either. So I don't know what to call him. I'll call him Muhammad. Okay. Now send this guy back to the pit of hell because this guy's another clown who thinks he knows the Bible. Okay, for the rest of you paying attention by the grace of Jesus Christ, may the Lord Jesus be glorified. May I not be a summary to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, focus now. Yeah, I know. I don't understand when you do. You understand it perfectly, which is why you can't answer questions. God bless you. Okay, now, why does Jesus have seven eyes? What do seven represent? What do seven represent again? What was the number seven symbolic of? Completion, right? Perfection. So why seven eyes? What do you do with eyes? You see. This is symbolic language showing that Jesus is our Passover lamb, who's the all-powerful king of creation. No power equals his, let alone can be greater than his. And he is the all-seeing, all-knowing king. Nothing escapes his grasp, his knowledge. And notice his union with the spirit. The eyes are the seven spirits. Not because God has literally seven spirits, but this is the Holy Spirit being symbolized as seven spirits, denoting the Holy Spirit is perfect in all he does. Perfect and complete in all he does. And so it shows the union of Jesus and the Spirit. Jesus in perfect, inseparable union with the Spirit. In union with the Spirit, he and the Spirit see all things and are present everywhere. The entire creation are present to Christ in union with the Holy Spirit. Right? Luis, are you getting it now? Hopefully I'm not too loud for people downstairs. Do you want to make sure our sister is getting it? Before I move on. Okay. Everyone else getting it, or is there people confused? I guess Luisa left, I guess. She's not here. All right. For the rest of you, can you hear me? You're saying, okay, I don't know what okay means. You mean, okay, you got it? You didn't get it? You got it? No, okay, okay, doesn't mean. I'm glad you're okay, but that doesn't tell me if you're getting it. All right. So then, why does he appear as seven lamps of fire before the throne? Revelation 4, verse 5. Forget about it, Alex. Stay confused because the menorah is not important to the discussion. Then I just say, don't let Satan's children distract you and you're being distracted. Revelation 4, verse 5. Okay. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay. What do you do with the lamp? This is pre-technology. They didn't have light bulbs. They didn't have, you know, electrical lighting. What do you do? What did you do with lamps in those days? You lit a lamp to do what? You lit a lamp. I didn't say how you light a lamp. You lit a lamp to do what with it? What do you do with a lamp? To see in the darkness. So what it means is, it is the Holy Spirit who grants perfect illumination. The light, the spiritual light that enlightens your minds and hearts. To know the truth and find the truth and walk on the path of truth is from God by the Spirit. This means the Holy Spirit is the one who grants perfect illumination, the light of revelation to know the truth and escape the darkness of the devil comes from God by the Spirit, which he sends to illuminate you. So the Spirit appears as seven lamps. Because it means perfect light, perfect illumination. That's from God by the Spirit. So when God wants to illuminate you and enlighten you, 
He does so by giving you the spirit who enables you to see your way out of the darkness into his glorious light of life. Exactly, Jane Melko. You understand what the symbolism all means? Everyone getting it? Louisa went silent. I hope she was getting it. Anna, are you here? You're silent too. Sometimes when Anna's silent, I'm... Oh, good, Louisa, you got it. When Anna's silent, I get scared. Most of you already know this, and you're being kind, so thank you. You know where I got the interpretation of Revelation 5-6? Do you know where I got the interpretation of Revelation 5-6? You're going to be shocked. You know where I got it from? Years ago, I got it from a booklet interpreting Revelation, Jehovah's Witnesses. And their booklet is online for free, and here's the section. When I read this in the Jehovah's Witness booklet, right, their booklet on Revelation, it's titled, Revelation, it's grand, grand climax at hand. Thank God they put it online. Here it is. It was the Jehovah Witness that helped me understand Revelation 5, 6 proves the Trinity and Jesus is all-knowing, present everywhere, and yet they think Jesus is a creature. Here it is. There's the link. Click on it. I'm going to read the section. Can you believe it? Even the enemies of Jesus, the enemies of the Trinity, write and say certain things that end up exposing their heresy and glorifying Christ. Here it is. If you go in that, all right, I just gave you the link. If you go to 12, it's numbered. What do the seven horns of the lamb picture? Let me read it to you. What else adds to our appreciation of the lamb? He has seven horns. Horns in the Bible are often a symbol of power or authority, and seven would indicate completeness. <whistles> That's why I learned it, folks. Even the enemies of the true God, the Trinity, can speak truth. And God can use even them to glorify the true God. Hence, the land's seven horns represent the fullness of power that Jehovah has entrusted to Jesus. Wow. Fullness of power? So Jesus is made almighty by Jehovah? Here you go. There's a section. Wow. Thank you, Jehovah Witness. Hence, the Lamb's seven horns represent the fullness of power that Jehovah has entrusted to Jesus. Folks, they're admitting you, this creature to them, this creature to them, he's a creature, is almighty. How can a creature be almighty? Now, let me continue reading. He is far above every government and authority and power and lordship and every name, name, not only in this system of things, but also in that to come, Jesus has particularly exercised power, governmental power, since 1914 when Jehovah enthroned him as heavenly king. False. But now, how do they explain the seven eyes? 13. A. What do the seven eyes of the lamb picture? B. What does the lamb proceed to do? Let's read. Moreover, Jesus is filled to completeness with Holy Spirit. Notice. Holy Spirit is not capitalized. The H and S are lowercase, and there's no definite article. As pictured by the Lamb's seven eyes, which mean the seven spirits of God. Jesus is a channel through whom the fullness of Jehovah's active force, meaning the Holy Spirit, flows to his earthly servants. <whistles> hmm. So seven spirits means the Holy Spirit in all his fullness, and Jesus is possessed of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Evidently, it is by this same spirit that he sees from heaven what is happening here on earth. Wow. Like his father, Jesus has perfect discernment. Nothing escapes his notice. My goodness. Wait. Notice they admit to you the seven spirits refers to the one spirit. Did you catch it? They're admitting to you it's not literally seven spirits. The seven spirits is the one spirit, the one Holy Spirit, and Jesus possesses the Holy Spirit in all his fullness. And because of that, Jesus is like his Father, who perfectly discerns everything. Wow.
The Jai, you there? That's where I learned it. The Joe's Witness helped me become stronger in my faith in the Trinity because, folks, they just admit to you, Jesus is all-knowing. He knows everything the Father knows. Like his Father, he has perfect discernment. So he discerns perfectly exactly like his Father. And like his Father, he possesses the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And like his Father, he's all-powerful. You got it? You got you understand your own enemies, the enemies of the Trinity, just admit to you the Trinity. And yet they still believe the Holy Spirit is not a person and Jesus is a creature. They can't see it because it's demonic, first and last. But you, you see, they admit seven is symbolic of perfection, and it's not seven spirits. It's one Holy Spirit who appears as seven spirits because in that symbol, those who have eyes to see and ears to hear will know that symbolizes the Holy Spirit in all his perfection and fullness and completion. Surprise, Jehovah's Witness. Everyone got it before I move on? I don't want to move on if you're not getting it. Do we now finally understand what Revelation 5, 6 means, the imagery? So let me repeat. John was truly taken into this dimension called heaven by the Holy Spirit. He saw things in heaven, some of which reflect what heaven actually looks like. Other things he saw in symbolism. In other words, don't expect to see Jesus as an actual young lamb with actual seven horns and seven eyes. And don't expect to see the Holy Spirit as seven lamps. All of this symbolic imagery is meant to convey a deeper spiritual truth about the reality of heaven and God. Clear? And everyone got it? The Joe's Witnesses helped me understand the interpretation of Revelation 5-6. See, God can even use false prophets, false teachers, his enemies to teach you the truth. And you find that in the Bible. He used Balaam, Balaam, to prophesy truth. He used Caiaphas, the high priest, to prophesy that Jesus would die for the salvation of the nation. John 11, verses 49 and 52. And yes, they did steal it from Trinitarians, but I didn't know that because I didn't have access to, to that information from Trinitarians, I had access to a Joe Witness who gave me this booklet to study, and I learned it from that. Right? Post what, first and last? I don't get it. We already posted it. Now, if you know what the seven spirits are, if you know what the seven spirits are, seven spirits, the Holy Spirit symbolized as seven spirits, to denote that he is perfect, he's complete, he lacks nothing, and everything he does is perfect and complete. So when he illuminates you, he grants you perfect illumination. <clears throat> and he sees all things perfectly, and the entire creation is present before him. So he sees things as they are. Nothing escapes his sight and knowledge, and he's in inseparable union with Christ. Christ and the Spirit are inseparable union. Christ is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not Christ, but they work inseparably. Clear now? Is it clear, guys? Because I want to move on to the point, to the meat. To the meat. Hit that like button. Get more people to subscribe and watch. Because you're getting meat, not, not vegan. Well, I'm not vegan here. Now. If you got it, that the seven spirits are the Holy Spirit. Now you're going to see a prayer to the Trinity. Do you now want to see a prayer to the Trinity in Revelation? Where John prays to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit to bless the recipients of the letter, to bless the readers of Revelation and the hearers of Revelation. He prays to the Trinity to bless anyone who hears or reads Revelation. You want to see the Trinity? No, not Holy, 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 Christos, and No, no, no. 
Revelation 1, verses 4 to 5. Revelation 1, verses 4 to 5. Let's see if you catch the Trinity. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace, favor be unto you, and peace. Who will give you favor and peace? From, pay attention to how many, which is and which was and which is to come, from the seven spirits which are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Here you have the Trinity, which is, which was, which is to come, the Father, the seven spirits, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ. Grace comes from Father, Spirit, and Son. Peace comes from Father, Spirit, and Son. Grace and peace be unto all churches from the one who is, who was, who is to come, the Father, and from, repeat it again, from, showing you the seven spirits is not the same as the Father, the seven spirits, and from Jesus Christ. That's a Trinitarian prayer and invocation, a prayer to the triune God, grace and peace from the one who is, who was, who is to come, the Father, and from the seven spirits, which are before his throne, the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ, the Father, Son. But then it gets a little better. Let's read Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Exactly, JWs. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten, of the dead, now watch here, a doxology, and I'm going to explain what a doxology is. And the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him, notice this is what's called the doxology. Doxology means a praise, where you glorify and praise God. Doxology, study of glory, to glorify, to praise. And to him, right, to him <clears throat> that loved us. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. So that's Jesus. The one washed us and released us of our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's what we call a doxology. Doxology. John just broke out in a praise to the son. Broke out in a praise where he glorifies the son for who he is and what he's done. Amen. Folks, you will not find a single doxology in the Old Testament given to someone other than God. You do not ascribe glory and praise to anyone in heaven who is not God. And challenge the anti-Trinitarian Jehovah's Witnesses. Show me a single place in the Old Testament where someone other than God in heaven receives this type of praise and glory and worship from people on earth. You won't find it. You won't find it. And in case you doubt that doxologies are given to God alone, Revelation 5.13. And then we're going to move on to another point. Revelation 5 verse 13. And ends with an amen, exactly. I mean, when you say amen at the end of the word, most likely that's because the author just finished in a word of praise. Watch. If you don't believe Jesus is God Almighty, which is why you can offer doxologies to him, watch this, guys, Revelation 5.13. We've read this so many times, you should already memorize this. Have memorized it. Revelation 5.13. And every creature, in case you don't get it, which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such are in the sea, and all that are in them. John exhausts the language so you don't miss it. Every created thing in entire creation. Not a single creature is exempt. Every creature that exists in creation, I heard them saying what? Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever.
John, you saw every creature, which means you would have also seen yourself. Every creature in every created place in entire creation, giving Jesus the Lamb the exact same honor and blessing and glory and power that the Father receives and for the same duration forever and ever. So the Lamb is not part of creation. He's distinct from every created thing that exists in creation. And he's on the side of the Father, the Creator side of the Creator creation divine. And he's worthy of the exact worship the Father receives from every creature forever. And you guys want to convince me Jesus is a creature. Okay. I am convinced. Okay, now that we explain what seven spirits mean, yes, yeah, some people tied in Ariel Gonzalez with Isaiah 11 verses 1 and 2, but you only count seven when you include that the fact that the spirit rests on him, right? If you go with the Masoretic text, Isaiah 11 verses 1 and 2, so count. Let's put Isaiah 11 verses 1 and 2. Yes, yeah, some connected with Isaiah 11. But it's not simply Isaiah 11 because you can't use Isaiah 11 to explain why he's the seven spirits in Revelation 4, 5, because there he's the seven lamps. So there's no connection with the Messiah. You can make that connection with Revelation 5, 6, but how does that connect with Revelation 4, verse 5? But now count with me, Ariel. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now, if I don't count that as one, let's count. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Joe, that's only six. So how do you get seven? By including the fact that the spirit rests on him. So that's how you get seven. So it may explain the connection with Revelation 5, 6. But how would this explain the connection with Revelation 4, 5? Where there, the seven spirits is the seven lamps. You get it, Ariel? You with me there? And you only get seven when you include that the spirit rests on him. If you don't count that, it's only six. <clears throat> it doesn't, Dominus. I'm asking the question to answer it. There is no connection. Not spirit of Jehovah, the spirit that's on him. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look at the Septuagint. Can someone put, well, let me look at it. See, that's what happens. Hold on. Yep, let's see. But remember, that may connect to Revelation 5, 6, but not with Revelation 4, 5. But let's count the Septuagint, the Greek version. I have the English translation right here. I'll read it. Here it goes. So let's see how the Greek rendering is slightly different. Let's see. Right. English translation of Greek. And there shall come forth a root, a rod out of the root of Jesse, and a blossom shall come up from his root. And the spirit of God shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and godliness shall fill him, and the spirit of the fear of God. So yes, here they add godliness as an extra characteristic. So yeah, the Greek version does give you seven. The Masoretic tradition doesn't. So if you count the Spirit of the Lord resting on him, that makes it seven. But then if you count that here in the Greek version, that's eight. You see the problem? So you end up with eight if you count the fact that the Spirit is on him. But either way, point is, that may connect it with Revelation 5 verse 6. But it doesn't connect with Revelation 4, 5. So I'm not saying, no, there isn't connection. I'm just simply saying you can connect that with the Lamb in Revelation 5, 6, but it doesn't necessarily explain Revelation 4, verse 5. And yeah, 8 is the number of the new creation that God ushers in, which is also circumcision, which represents spiritual regeneration. Anyway, I hope I didn't confuse the rest of you. <clears throat> Everyone got this thus far? Guys, 
even a blind man and woman can see, the Bible shouts, Trinity, 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 the true God who is real is Trinity, triune, Jesus who's alive, who's not make-believe, who actually lives, he is alive, who is real, he's God in the flesh. Even a blind man, blind woman can see it. I hope you guys are being blessed by these sessions. In spite of my imperfections and failures, pray I can become more like Jesus. Pray I can be used of the Lord to bless you guys because I want you to be in love with Jesus, in love with his word. You see why I encourage everyone? And there are people here who don't subscribe to Sola Scriptura. There are traditions that follow what they call Prima Scriptura. So I want to encourage the Catholics, the Orthodox, the Syrian Church, the East. Man, eat up the Bible. After all, you believe that God gave the Bible to the church. And you believe it was your church that God used to give us the Bible. Then eat it up. Learn it. Understand the biblical foundation for your doctrines, man. Right? Why wouldn't you want to learn... The biblical basis for your doctrines. Amen. Church of the East, the church of my parents, my ancestors, my beloved mother, and my father as well. Yeah, but don't eat them too much. The fathers want to be intact. So, Anna, be careful. Don't be obese, a spiritual obese. Okay. My blessed mother, even my father, was baptized in the church of the East, got married in the church of the East, and had her funeral service in the church of the East. My beloved mother. With that said, let's focus. Are we ready now to go into Hebrews 1? Guys, I gave you the background in the previous session today and now this session because I want to unpack Hebrews 1. If you haven't listened to the first session, please don't ask me questions addressed in the first session. Please listen, re-listen, re-listen. Hit the like button, upload it to your YouTube channels, and spread these links because I demonstrated the difference between Jesus being the angel of God with the angels of Hebrews 1. And, hey, it's a long story, brother. Let's not talk about my biography unless you want my Social Security and my, my bank, my routing number. Let's focus on the topic. I'm not important. What I am, what I'm not, not important. What's important is the Bible and Jesus, and he, he be glorified by the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. I don't know, Alex. I'm scared for you to ask questions because you may attack me. Okay? Yeah, Church of the East means the Assyrian Church. Assyrian, not Syrian. Assyrian, Ashuraya, Aturaya. Yahoni, ituch bahidach, bididgani, Yahoni, tirinit, 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 bitnohrin, atriwat. <clears throat> yeah, pray that OCD leaves me too. All right, are we ready? Okay, ready, guys? Hebrews 1, let's unpack it. How does Hebrews 1 destroy Joe's witnesses and heretics like Greg Stafford? And I pray that coward will debate me and not run his mouth off on his YouTube channel. Right? Nope. Don't insult me. I was not a Mohammedan. I was not a stone licker. All right, let's go. Hebrews 1. Let's unpack it. Verses 3 to 5. Okay. Hebrews 1, verses 3 to 5. Sailing along, Mulai Bay. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things, upholding all things by the word of his power, name what happened lord please uh oh i'm buffering guys please pray it doesn't buffer i don't want to have to connect to the router and the modem oh my goodness i got scared please lord have mercy guys can we stop talking about assyrians and syrians focus guys please okay anyway hebrews 1 3 to 5 it started buffering on my end hebrews 1 3 to 5 who Upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels. I explained that yesterday. Go listen to yesterday's session, what it means and what it doesn't mean. 
as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Folks, time for meat. Are you ready for meat? Time for meat. Definitely I got to do a part four. God willing, Lord willing, maybe tomorrow. Okay. If you don't understand the Bible and you read it on a surface level, you have a contradiction. You know why? Because here it says, God never said to an angel, you are my son. And yet in the Old Testament, angels are said to be the sons of God. Do we have a contradiction? Here it says, God never said and will never say to an angel, you are my son and I'm your father. But hold on, Hebrews. Job 38 verse 7 says, when God laid the foundation of the earth before man was created, the sons of God rejoiced at seeing God make the earth. Those sons of God weren't humans, they were angels. Job 38 verse 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The sons of God here cannot be humans because it's talking about God creating the earth. That's if you start reading from 4 to 6. And when he laid the foundation of the earth and finished fashioning the earth as a temple for him to live in, the sons of God rejoiced. That's angels. Still don't, don't believe they're angels? Job 1, verse 6. No, there is no difference between son and sons. If an angel, if angels are sons, then one angel is a son. It's like saying, you are my sons, but road FFM, I'll never call you my son. Does that make sense? Job 1, 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Jehovah, and Satan came also among them. This is in heaven, folks. During this time, humans were on earth, angels were in heaven, but they're called sons of God. Sons of God. And how did the Greek version render Job 1.6? Tikanis, gesikala. Come on, Eddie. Right. Opa! Here's the English translation of the Greek. Job 1 6. Opa! There you go. Here it is. First and last quoted it. All right, there you go. Here's the link. And it came to pass on a day that, behold, the angels of God came to stand before the Lord, and the devil came with them. Did you guys catch it? The Hebrew says, Bene Elohim. The sons of God. The Greek translates Bene, sons of God, as the angels of God. And here, if you go to that link, it gives you the English and the Greek. So if you look, Job 1, verse 6, you look to your right, what you're going to find in the Greek is, it says, Oi, or Oi, Engeloi, that's their asking pronunciation, to Theu. Oi. And glue to the you. Hmm. Opa. Okay. Guys, don't worry about why they're called sons of God. Don't get into that, please. Please don't make me change subject. Okay. Focus with me. Focus with me. No, who told you it's a mistranslation? Guala. No, it's not a mistranslation. It's telling you. These sons of God are the spirit creatures that live in heaven, the angels, because the scene is in heaven. Humans are on earth. And up until Christ's death, resurrection, ascension, humans did not enter God's heavenly presence. We now enter because Jesus opened heaven for us. And I did a session on that a week ago. Okay, clear? Opa. All right, so is there a contradiction? Hebrews 1 says, God never said to any angel, you are my son. But we have references to angels being the sons of God. Well, if the angels are the sons of God, that means each specific angel is a son of God and God is their father. Do we have a contradiction? No, if you've been paying attention. If you've been paying attention, there is no contradiction. You should be able to understand what it means. What's the answer? For those of you who are listening, and you guys, a lot of you already know this already. I'm preaching to the choir. Look at Alex getting focused on bullets. 
Alex, if you learn who Bullis is, is that going to help you understand the session? What's the answer? Since angels are the sons of God, why would Hebrews say, God never said to any angel, you are my son? What's the answer? There is no contradiction. Come on, help me out. It's okay, Alex. Step right back in. What's the answer? See, Jade? You're going to make me hang myself because I feel like I wasted my time on these sessions. Pedro got it. No, Anna, you're, you're killing me too. You're my mod, and you've been here, and you listen to sessions, and you don't know the answer? Jesus Christ is the Lord, got it. Candace, no, that's not the answer. Ariel got it. Three of you got it so far. That means you've been paying attention or you already know this. Well, let me see if I'm not wasting my time. Three people got it. I'm just going to wait one more and see. Yeah, and Jake, were you here when I explained Psalm 27 has nothing to do with Jesus' eternal begetting? Alex got it. No, Brat Mashiach, no. Then you, you weren't paying. See why I keep telling you guys? Re, re listen to the sessions. Jake, you got it. Because Hebrews 1 5 is quoting verses speaking about what and whom. Jake, no, it has nothing to do with the eternal sonship, brother. Don't make me waste my time. Repeat myself, please. No, N.A., that's not the answer. You're not getting it. Yeah. Coronation. Kingship. You guys forgot already? I just did the session, what, yesterday, day before? Kingship. The coronation of the Davidic king. The coronation of the king of Israel. A kingship and a kingdom given to a human being named David and his human sons. So what Hebrews 1.5 is saying, God has never honored an angel to sit on his throne on earth. But that honor he gave to a human being, David, and his human sons. Exactly. You're born yesterday, should have got it. You forgot all that time I unpacked on what Hebrews 1.5 means? Guys, if you don't get this, you're not going to be affected. Let me be honest with you. If no, original designer, I'll give you $50 million if you show me Melchizedek. Jesus is a king in the order of Melchizedek. Stuck for Allah, Rabbil Alameen. If you're not learning these arguments, you guys won't be affected. You won't be able to prove your point exegetically and refute the blasphemies against the Trinity. And that's your fault because I've been doing multiple sessions and repeating myself like a broken record. Exactly, Candace. Did God ever honor an angel to be the heir apparent to the throne of David? Did God ever send an angel to sit on his throne on earth, a throne that he gave to a human being named David as human descendants? Never. Never. You understand what that means, though? Jesus can't be a spirit, angelic creature. Otherwise, you have a contradiction. Jesus must be a human being, a human son of David in heaven. Otherwise, Hebrews 1.5 is contradicting itself. Phil, what has that got to do with his kingship, Phil? For the love of our Lord, what does that got to do with kingship? His priesthood is in the order of Melchizedek. His kingship is what he receives from David. What are you guys talking about? You understand? If you get the point of Hebrews 1, you destroy Jehovah's Witnesses. You bury their theology in the pit of hell from where it came and send it back to hell. If you understand, 
Mr. Jehovah Witness, Jesus cannot be the archangel Michael because God did not give the throne of David to an angel. He gave it to a human descendant of David, which means if Jesus isn't human, then he's not a human descendant of David. That means he cannot sit on the throne fulfilling the promise to David. You understand how this now obliterates Jehovah's Witnesses? If you understand Hebrews 1. You understand why I'm getting so passionate and adamant? You get it? Exactly, Ken. It's all, don't worry. It's tough love. It's like when a, when a karate instructor gets tough on one of his students. Right? You get it now? If you understand Hebrews 1, Joe's Witnesses, over. You send their theology to the pit of hell from where it came. And you destroy it by the blood of the Lamb, according to the word that the Spirit inspired. Jared, you want me to send you on your merry way? You want me to get, get you out of here? When I just said, I explained the difference between Jesus being an angel and these angels of Hebrews 1. Do you need to get out of here? Because I just spent a session on that before I did this one. You want me to send you on your merry way? Do you want, you want it in a package or do you want me to just throw you out? All right. Okay, so didn't you hear when I said, don't comment if you didn't hear the previous session, Jared? And you wonder why I'm a stern taskmaster and a very harsh Taekwondo instructor. Junbe! Chikirike! Hana! Do! Don't comment, Jared, if you haven't watched the first session, please. Cobra Kai. For the rest of you who have listened to the sessions, if anyone tells you Jesus is not a human being, you destroyed Hebrews. Throw Hebrews out of your Bible. Hebrews should not be in your Bible. Okay? Because the promises quoted in Hebrews 1 5, Psalm 2 7, 2 Samuel 7 14, we already went over it. They refer to David and his human sons, specifically Solomon, being chosen to sit on God's throne on earth. He gave the throne to a human being, a specific human being. Okay, send Phil out of here. Phil's got to, Phil, don't come back to my channel. Go to someone else, Mike Winger. He'll probably help you out. I can't help you, brother. Get out of here. All right? A specific human being. Okay. The throne of God on earth. The throne, yeah, he's more gentle, more likable, more personable than me, and he's a brother in Christ. So go there. Honestly, I'm not putting him down. Remember, God has raised up a variety of teachers to draw a variety of people. No one person will draw everyone to himself. And God has done that deliberately. There's wisdom in that. But now focus. All right? The throne of God on earth was given to who? If you remember the session, see, that's why I drill you like a drill sergeant. Listen, re-listen, re-re-listen. So become second nature so you can teach it. You're robbing people in your life of this information that you're learning and not understanding. Because then you can teach it to others and blow them away by the power of the Spirit to have no doubt but fall madly in love with Jesus and his word. Right. So according to Psalm 2.7 and 2 Samuel 7.14, which Hebrew cites in Hebrews 1.5, the kingship that was given on earth, was it given to angelic creatures or was it given to a human being? David and his sons. So you understand what Hebrews is saying. You understand what Hebrews is saying. God did not give the throne of David to an angel. Therefore, if Jesus fulfills the promises to David, he cannot be an angel. He has to be a human being 
even now in heaven, or Hebrews is wrong, throw him out. So we're going to park on this. I'm not going to go anywhere. We're going to hammer this. You get it now? So when a Jehovah Witness tells you Jesus is not man in heaven, but he's the Archangel Michael, Hebrew says your organization is a lie from the pit of hell, and your father and your society's father is the devil. Repent. Because Hebrews is your nightmare if you understand Hebrews. If you understand Hebrews. Not just quote it on the surface level, on a shallow level. If you understand it. Did everyone get it now? Now, how do I know that Hebrews 1 is talking about angelic creatures? Angelic creatures. Hebrews 1 verse 7. Hebrews 1 verse 7. And of the angels, he, he said, who maketh his angel spirits. Did you catch it? He made them this way. He created them to be spirits who can assume various shapes and forms. His minister is a flame of fire. So he created these beings to be shapeshifters, angels by nature, created to be messengers and servants who can appear in various forms, take on various shapes. So these are created angels. Now, these angels that were created to be messengers and servants, their very nature is to be messengers who serve. Are they like the sun? No, because notice the contrast. Hebrews 1.7, Hebrews 1.8. There's a contrast again. He contrasts angels who were created to be ministers and shapeshifters with the sun, who is God that reigns forever. Hebrews 1.8. Notice the contrast. And of the angels, he saith, about angels, God says, I made these angels to be spirits. I made them ministers to assume various shapes like flame of fire. Unlike the sun, because notice the contrast. But, but, however, about the sun, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. You see again the contrast? My son is unlike these angelic creatures. The angelic creatures I made to be ministers who serve. I made them to be angels and to be shapeshifters, unlike my son, who is the God that reigns forever and who is man. You caught it now? Jake, they won't have a response to this if you know how to properly present it. Unfortunately, most Trinitarians don't even understand Hebrews 1, let alone properly present it to silence the blasphemies of the Jehovah's Witnesses. You get it now? Is him saying it? How do you expect a Christian to silence a Jehovah's Witness and show Hebrews 1 destroys their theology and shows it's a satanic doctrine when they don't even understand Hebrews 1? How many of you have read Hebrews 1 and didn't understand the point of Hebrews 1? Why is the author, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saying all this? And how does it show he's infinitely better than angels who are created? You have an Ariel? Man, brother, thank you. That's a blessing to my heart because you're well, very well read and knowledgeable and you've heard other apologists thank you bro really praise god so guys honestly i'm not lying to you if you learn these arguments man you guys are going to be powerhouses nightmares for anti-trinitarians and heretics for the glory of jesus by the power of the holy spirit yeah thank you Ariel. god bless you my brother you're a blessing to me Pray God will save me from my calamities. Please, Lord. I want to take time. I do this for the love of the Lord, and I love him imperfectly to my shame. Lord, help me love you perfectly and love you guys perfectly for his sake. So you getting it now? You know what blows me away? Let me share a story. As I, is it you sinking in before I move on? Because I'm going to do a part four. You know I'm going to do a part four.
You know I got to do a part four, right? You won't mind if I do a part four on this, God willing? Lord willing, tomorrow do a part four? All right. Let me tell you why I'm blown away and humbled. Um, again, you know, I, like I said, I've been crying like a sissy more than ever before. I may end up crying. Let me tell you my story how I got here and why Satan has been attacking me and continues to attack me, wants to destroy my ministry and me and put me away. But by the blood of Jesus, he will never succeed because Jesus is my shield. Let me tell you how I got here. In the early 90s, a Muslim apologist tore me to shreds and embarrassed me in a church because he asked me questions that I could not answer. I remember going home that night. Honestly, not lying to you. I was in my bed. And I started crying. I go, God, I don't know what to believe about Jesus or about the Bible. I'm so confused. I'm so confused. I'm giving you the gist what I said. It's been so long, but this was the gist. I go, God, I, I promise you, if you give me answers to these objections, I will commit my life to making sure none of my Christian brothers and sisters ever get embarrassed by anyone ever again. And I will devote myself in honoring you and serving Christians if you answer me. And here I am. You see why my passion is to teach Christians? Notice most of my sessions are geared towards Christians. Not so much Muslims, not because I don't love Muslims, but I need to take care of my own house before I, I worry about someone else's house. Do you know that? You are the household of my father. <clears throat> See, I'm about to cry here. You're the household of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're part of the same household. We have the same father, the same Savior, and the same Spirit. It does me no good to worry about someone else's house and leave the household of my father unattended and not taking care of my brothers and sisters. And that's why I do what I do. You understand? And this is why I'm harsh with heretics. Let me tell you why I'm harsh with heretics. That guy mocked me, humiliated me, and insulted me. He wasn't kind. So that put something in my heart that when I see a mocker, I put him in his place. And Christians don't understand why. Why would you do that? Because if you knew how he mocked and laughed and insulted my God, and I could do nothing to silence him. Glory to God, that same filthy coward, that dog. I saw him years later after the Lord gave me answers. And he ran out of the store with his tail between his legs, legs like a rabid dog. The Lord had given me vengeance. Yeah, exactly, Ariel. That's why, why do you think, Ariel, I say, if someone challenges me, you're not going to get me to listen. I think it's psychological and subconscious because when I get challenged, I feel like someone wants to attack me and embarrass me and humiliate me. That's not going to work with me. So if you just present your case and don't challenge me, I'll listen. I won't debate you. So it goes back from that encounter in the 90s. So now, lo, lo and behold, you see what a good God he is? how real our God is, that that young man, I wasn't a boy, early 20s, the God of heaven, heard my pleas, I'm about to cry out, <clears throat> heard my pleas, no high school education, no college, no university, no seminary. The God of heaven heard my pleas, and the God of heaven allowed me to go through that because the God of heaven was saying, son, you are my chosen instrument and you will be. <clears throat> the slave of the triune God. You will glorify the triune God on earth as long as you live until you die. Yeah, that's why I'm here. No. High school. No college, no seminary. Don't let them deceive you. You don't need it. God has given you all you need for free if you study this material. 
Right. Eli, early on, I noticed God had given me an ability to retain information and recall it because that was God's gifting, and he's preparing me for this. Right. And if the Lord tarries, you know what I want my testimony to be? I want my testimony to be for the glory of Christ, not for my praise. May the Lord crucify my flesh. If the Lord tarries and I leave this world, this is what I want my testimony to be. <clears throat> that man was in love with the Trinity. And he was a soldier of the triune God till his last dying breath. That's what I want my testimony to be. I love my God. I love my God, even though I love him perfectly. I love my Father. I love my Lord Jesus, and I love the Holy Spirit. I love him. That's what I want. That man, though he was a sinner and had issues and he was imperfect, he loved the Trinity, and he was a soldier of the triune God. Now, that's why, you see, I try to go in-depth on these issues and why I keep telling you, why I keep telling you, learn these arguments. These are battle-tested arguments, arguments we've used in spiritual battle perfected by the Spirit that are irrefutable, indestructible, because these are the weapons of the Almighty God, and His weapons are indestructible, right? So please learn these arguments. Please learn these arguments. So let's sum up. How does Hebrews 1.5 prove that Jesus is not an angelic creature? Let's go back and look at Hebrews 1.5. Let's look at it again. Lisa, thank you, sister. <laughs> thank you so much. <clears throat> let's read it again. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament context. And you know I got to do a part four. I'm going to do a part four. You know that, right? You know that, right? I got to do a part four. It's got to happen. You know that. Now, let's go. Let's go to the context. Let's go to 1 Samuel 24, 28, verses 4 to 7. 1 Samuel 28, verses 4 to 7. Atheist lady, why are you here? If you're an atheist, why are you here? Please, can you tell me why you're here? Are you here to attack and mock God? Is that what you're doing, atheist lady? Were you the same one, the Syrian lady, the Syrian atheist that came under a fake nick to try to attack me, that you got blocked? Why are you here, sister? Please, my sister in humanity. If you don't love God, why are you here? And if you're going to mock, you know you're going to get blocked. Okay, so you want to sit here and listen and learn? Okay, good. I didn't know. She scared me. She said, atheist lady. <laughs> Guys, I'm, gun I'm trigger happy. I'm trigger happy. I get attacked so much by heretics, I'm ready to shoot. In fact, I I'm the one who shoots first and asks questions later, right? So if you're here to learn, you're more than welcome to stay. But please don't mock, don't attack. Just listen, atheist lady. Okay? Oh, I didn't know that. Thank you. Uh, but now, my prayer is you will be a Trinitarian lady, a godly lady for the Trinity. Okay? Keep listening, sister. You're on your way. Right? And in fact, if you're sold out for the Trinity and you love the Trinity, I'll get you married to Ariel. But I can't preside over the ceremony because I'm not a priest and I'm not qualified. But if you become a Trinitarian who's in love with Jesus and sold out for Jesus, Ariel, and you're going to get married. 1 Samuel 28, verses 4 to 7. And I'll come to your wedding. I can't preside over it. Maybe we can get uh, Father Mitchell Pacwa. Okay, read with me. 1 Samuel 28, 4 to 6. Verses 4 to 6. 1 Samuel 28, verses 4 to 6. And the... Why did I say 1 Samuel? Thank you, first and last. You have proven yourself a worthy soldier. I was testing you. I was testing you if you would quote the wrong passage even though I gave you the wrong passage. It's not 1 Samuel 28. It's 1 Chronicles 28. You passed the test, my brother. Guys, he passed the test. I was testing him. I gave him the wrong chapter, 
And as a good brother in Christ, he didn't challenge me. He posted the wrong chapter. When I met 1 Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 7. You passed, my brother. You don't suffer from Alzheimer's like Protestant does. Okay. 1 Samuel. Uh, why Samuel on my tongue? 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 6. David speaking. How be it, the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. So David's saying, who did God choose? Me, a human Israelite from the tribe of Judah. Okay, Not an angel. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler. And of the house of Judah, from the tribe he chose Judah, and from the clans of Judah, my father's house, and among my father's sons, right? He liked me. To make me king over Israel. Now watch. Watch the promise. Watch the promise here. And of all my sons, for Jehovah the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon whose throne? Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of Jehovah over Israel. Did you catch it? Solomon sits on whose throne? Jehovah's throne over Israel. Thank you, Seek. But Seek, you don't need to post. He's posting for us. It's 1 Chronicles 22, 7 to 10. Seek, my friend, if you're seeking truth in Christ, don't post for us. We're going to get it. Respect the wishes here. First last is going to do it. You see it? Now, let's read 7. I'm going to read 7. Conditional for Solomon, unconditional for David. I'll explain that because I mentioned that in the previous section. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom, Solomon's kingdom forever, if he, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. But now notice what he says about Solomon. Not only did he choose Solomon to sit on his throne, notice 6, and he said unto me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house, and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. There you go. Okay, did you catch it? Here you go. Did you catch it? David, you have been chosen to be king on my throne over Israel on earth. David, you have many sons. Solomon will replace you when you die. And when he takes the throne, I'll be his father. He'll be my son. And if he obeys my covenant, he'll remain forever. Now, 1 Chronicles 29, 23. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 23. Watch. Then Solomon sat on the throne. Whose throne did he sit? Of Jehovah as king in the place of David his father. And prospered and all Israel obeyed him. Notice what Hebrews is saying. When God gave his earthly kingdom. He didn't give it to an angel. He gave it to a human being, David and his sons. Therefore, God never said to an angel, sit on my throne and become my royal son. Yes, they are sons of God, but not in this sense. Because the Bible uses the term son in different ways, in different senses. So God never told an angel, become my royal son, sitting on the throne representing me. And in that sense, becoming a son to me, when you sit on the throne representing me, that God has never said to any angel. He's only said it to David and his sons. First Chronicles 29, 23. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David, his father, and prospered in all Israel, obeyed him. Now, Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 8. Thank you, KG. Second Chronicles 9, verse 8. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee. This is the Queen of Sheba saying to Solomon. He set you on his throne to be king for the Lord thy God, because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore made he the king over them to do judgment and justice. Now, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 13 verse 8. 2 Chronicles 13, verse 8. 
And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of who? The sons of David. Whose hands? The sons of David. The kingdom is David's and his sons who inherit the throne from him. And ye shall be a great multitude. And there are with you golden calves, which Jeroboam made, for, made you for gods. Now, 2 Chronicles 21, verse 7. Howbeit, the Lord will not destroy the house of David. Why would he not wipe out the house of David, eradicate and remove it from his sight? Because of the covenant that he had made with David, and as he promised to give a light to him and to his sons forever. There you go. Is that clear? I already discussed Psalm 89 in the previous sessions. I'm not going to go over Psalm 89 again. We discussed in the previous sessions. So what is Hebrews 1 saying? Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1, this guy, oh my goodness. KG, let me stop my talk. Let me change subjects to refute a Muslim who says Mary is from the line of Levi. Let me forget everything I said and let me refute the Muslim for you. Not, you can't pay attention, you'll be gone. Okay, now pay attention here. Okay, so what is Hebrews 1 saying? Hebrews 1 is not saying God has never called angelic creatures, creatures his sons. Because they are his sons in one sense. What Hebrews 1 is saying is God has never appointed an angelic creature to take the throne as David's heir and become his son in that sense, the royal son of God. You know me there? So can you name one angelic creature? That God says, here you go, the throne of David is yours. And on the day that you take the throne, you'll be my son in that sense. Has he ever done it? But folks, he said that to Jesus. He said that to Jesus. He said to Jesus, my son. Now that you've entered heaven and you sit at my right hand, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. I've become your father. You've become my son. In what sense? As a son of David, the heir of David's throne, inheriting the promises of David, fulfilling my covenant to David. You got it now? See, so notice the guys can't control themselves. Tom can't control himself. He's going to discussion about Mary's lineage. Disrespect me and everyone else because they can't control themselves and get into the side issue. But, folks, you know what this means, right? You know what this means? Since only a human physical descendant of David can take the throne of David and become God's son, for Jesus to be the fulfillment of Psalm 2-7 and 2 Samuel 7-14. What does that mean about Jesus? What is he in heaven? What is he in heaven? But wait, the Jehovah Witnesses tell me Jesus is the archangel Michael, he's not a man. You remember when I asked that heretical dog, E-E-W, is Jesus a man in heaven? And he said, no. You remember that? Why do you think I asked him the question? You guys understand why I was asking the question? You remember that session you guys hear? Why? Do you, because I said, you just destroyed Hebrews and you just created a contradiction in Hebrews, you satanic dog. You see why I got upset with him? Because the point of Hebrews is, Jesus is no angelic creature. He's a bona fide, physical human descendant of David, which is why God can say those things to Jesus, but he never said it to an angelic creature. Yep, Sydney, that's who he is.
Who's not getting it? Because we're going to end it shortly and we're going to do part two tomorrow. Who's not getting it? I don't know why it's clever. It's true. I don't know why it's clever. Okay. God willing, we're going to go more on what way are angels God's sons and in what way are they not the sons of God? Right? Tomorrow I'll do that, but I'm not going to bite you. And you understand, angels are the sons of God in a different sense. Angels are the sons of God in a different sense. The type of sonship that Hebrews is talking about is royal sonship, being the royal son of God. What do I mean by royal? A human being from the house of David, chosen to sit on God's throne, representing God, carrying on God's work on earth as his representative, bearing and resembling and reflecting the characteristics of God and his rule on earth, which is why he's called the son. Because the son is supposed to bear resemblance. He's supposed to resemble his father and do the work of his father. So he's saying to the Davidic kings, now you are my sons in that you're supposed to resemble me and my rule on earth. That's why, that's why they failed, Bob. To a T, they all failed. To a T, they all failed. You with me there? No, actually, yeah, you're right, Ariel. He's not. He can't be a spirit creature, Ariel. Because if he is, he can't be the heir of David. That's the point. He's not an angelic creature. To which of the angels did he say? To no spirit creature, Errol. Yes, you're getting it. Because if he's an angelic spirit creature, then he did say it to someone. He said it to him. You get it? You're getting it. If you tell me he's a spirit creature, then that's it. It's over. Because by angels, he means all Heavenly creatures, no one exempt. God never conferred on any heavenly creature this honor of being a Davidic king and heir of David to fulfill the promises to David. Exactly, Ariel. You're getting it, man. Bye-bye, Arius. Bye-bye, Arius. Goodbye. Don't forget to ride. Goodbye. Everyone got that part? Let me give you the articles, and we'll do part four tomorrow because we're going to stop here, Lord willing. Two articles again that goes with a session. Here it is. Here is. This is now part four. I give you links to the previous parts. Is Michael the ruler of Israel? That's part four, God willing, and the other one. Goodbye. Goodbye. Proving that Jesus is not the archangel. Michael, here is the second article. Save them, study them, download them, upload them, do whatever. Okay? Goodbye. Exactly, Ariel. It proves Jehovah's wrong two counts. He was not formerly Michael, and Jesus did not become Michael again after his resurrection. Because if you understand Hebrews, God would never give the, the honor to any heavenly creature, spirit creature, because my angels... He means heavenly creatures, all of them. Angels is an inclusive term, meaning all heavenly creatures. God has never given this honor to any heavenly creature to be the Davidic heir, fulfilling the covenant to David. But according to them, Jesus is a heavenly creature, the first creature, which means contradiction. Now, they're going to deny that it means that. No, it doesn't mean that. Who told you it doesn't mean that? It's right in your face. No, no, no. no. And then they're going to say, well, the son is not an angel. Uh, hold on. Is he a spirit being that he created? Yes. Well, by angel here, he means all created spirit beings, heavenly spirit creatures. Thank you for calling me damn, Atu. He's saying, loving these materials, damn. I don't know if you're like, damn, these materials are good. Or man, damn you, Sam, you. All right. So now if you got it, you got two sessions today. 
Guys, I'm going to repeat it like a broken record. If you don't listen to these sessions and the previous sessions, you won't learn the material. It won't become second nature. Then you can't use it to glorify the triune God and decimate the lies of Satan and silence the children of Satan with the hopes that they'll repent and be saved or be silenced once and for all. You won't be able to. You won't. Look, trust the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is almighty. He will make you wise to understand these things. And I'm proof. Let me encourage you. No high school diploma. No college. No seminary. No university. As a sign that God can take stupid people like me and then transform them and fill them with wisdom to silence the wise men of this age and of Satan as the dogs that they are for the glory of the triune God. So be encouraged. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God, the Son. The Son of the Father, the eternal companion of the Spirit, the Father and the Son and the Spirit. The three are the one God, Jehovah Almighty. And there's nothing anyone can do to deny this fact of revelation. We love you, Father. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Holy Spirit. Bless us, save us, and preserve us and our loved ones, my daughters, all of us, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. And fight our battles, my battles, please, only you can win them and give me favor and set me free so I can have the freedom to travel to glorify you. Bring my daughters to me, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, and bless those who are in need. They have health issues. Grant them the health they need to serve you and love you. If they have emotional issues, heal them by the wounds, the stripes of the Lamb who purchased the redemption of our bodies, our souls, our spirits, our minds, and our hearts by the blood of his cross. Please, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. And if there's anyone among us who are not saved, bring them to salvation. And loved ones who are not saved, bring them to salvation. And strengthen your church on earth to be the church militant so that we can be the church triumphant and victorious by the blood of the cross and the sword of the Spirit. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray for me, my daughters, my health, their health, and provision and for safety. Lord willing, I'll try to be on tomorrow between 4 and 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 4 and 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care.